thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is now the ninth or tenth episode of Straight Talk. All right. Uh, really, it's been we never thought it will grow up like this, and we'll have perspective from different. Today's uh, perspective, which is very different from what we have had so far. So really, big thank you to Sam for taking this up, and thank you, thank you so much. Move on. Uh, agenda remains same, right? Some things do not change, and that's good, right? Uh, Sam has uh, basically told me just we just had a quick chat before this call. Uh, I'm all, I, I'm also not privy to what he's going to share, so I'm looking forward to it, and. Uh, he just said that he has 60 questions to all of us, right? And let's see uh, if, uh, you know, uh, how do we fare them, yeah? Thanks, Sam, for putting that up. Awesome, let's move on. You know, uh, we have always been thinking about uh, and talking about players, uh, batters at straight bat. Uh, uh, the idea was how do you improve premium, bat premium batsmen get better? Guess what, in cricket, the 11, 11 players actually bat. Right, and very often, as was probably showed by Australian team in late 90s and early 2000s, is that the late runs actually makes a huge difference. Right, uh, when you're talking about uh, winning the game and showing that you can come back from real losing positions to win. So this is an interesting case study. This this southpaw is a number 10 bat. If you see, and uh, Nav, if you can put your mouse in the before, yeah. So if you see his, uh, the top view of his back, this is his starting position of his back. Under 19, player, obviously talented, plays number 10. And this is his starting position, all right? And he goes, and if you go to the front view, this is his back lift, net, net, all right? Obviously, it was way beyond, you know, uh, the normal sphere because coming beyond the 90 itself. Uh, the player saw this data, he spoke to his coach, right? And uh, there was a huge uh, discussion on how do we go about changing this. They, they went ahead and they practiced. This young man played a match winning innings coming at 10 and scoring 60 odd. He felt so much more confident about his new batting style and back lift, right? And numbers that are there in front of you, right? That 86 to a 20 degree shift he could manage by just seeing what is happening to him and he could make an impact. A lot of people, a lot of times said, ah, you know, straight bat is for batters. I think straight bat is for every player who bats. And that's very important, but uh, we forget that 10, 11 actually can make much more improvement the needle can move so much more for them. We forget about that. So we wanted to put forth this point of view that small differences there can give you runs which are almost like gold dust. Yeah, it was an interesting case study. Thought we'll share that with you. Yeah, let's move on, please. We've talked a lot about drives, the front foot in the V, right? Uh, Julian talked about playing in the V, hitting straight, but not playing the V, hitting straight, but not playing, oh, yeah, not hitting straight, but playing straight. Yeah, which basically means that wherever you hit, you can hit straight, but there's a 360 degree play. And if you look at square of the wicket axis, right, and we, we collated a huge amount of data. We did a lot of data crunching, right? And we saw that anyways, the timing in the square of the wicket is, and we discussed it in one of the episodes, is rather lower when compared to when you're playing in the V. It's not, it's not a surprise, but it shows that for when you're playing in the V, you need more time to line up and probably be, have um, eye over the ball. So behind the crease, the timing efficiency is 85%, the impact point. Around the crease is 80. When you're meeting the ball ahead of the crease, when you're playing square, it's 74%. Something we probably know that, you know, when you're playing square, give yourself a bit of time and hit it. 6% timing index behind and 15% compared to ahead of the crease. So there is solid data which shows while the planking of the bat and hitting it across may not be the most efficient, uh, planking of the foot rather, may not be the most efficient way to you know access the square of the wicket. So we were just trying to analyze why uh, on square of the wicket, the timing is rather lower than playing in the V. We thought we'll put this forward in terms of data. 
as a part of state bad insights yeah with this uh, wanted to hand it over to sam sam uh, over to you uh, if you could share your screen let me know if you need access you have it so it's good sam you on mute wasn't letting me unmute while uh, I was in full screen there. So how's that everyone? Fine? Yeah, all good. That's a, a nice introduction, a nice segue, Gagan, because I, I think uh, a lot of, some of, or some of what I talk about today is about challenging the norms and, and, and challenging a little bit of dogma. And I think it's a nice example there about how, uh, you know, how a, a lower, well, a lower order batsman can actually have an impact. So uh, it's a nice segue in, thank you. Uh, so today I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, technology and about skill. Um, and I'm gonna ask a couple of uh, contemplative questions throughout. Uh, and again, feel free to either not answer these at all or just think about them and, or maybe write them in the chat if, if you so desire. Uh, and I think there's three or four in particular that I'll, I'll focus on. And the first one is, is what makes a good coach? Now, this seems like a fairly easy question to answer, but it does vary quite a lot when I ask this to different sports. Um, and, and of course, people different from different backgrounds and different ages and different cultures. Um, and invariably, I get a bit of a follow-up question, which is, well, it depends a little bit about what the role of the coach is. And again, different sports treat this question slightly differently. But regardless of what sport you're in, right now uh, basically technology is impacting what that role is not only in in cricket but any sport that i've been involved with um, which it, which i've been fortunate enough to be involved in, in a lot of a lot of different sports over the last decade or so so i'll split this talk into two sections the first part i'll talk about is the role of of technology and how it has transformed sport and how it's going to do that even more in the future whether we like it or not and then i'll talk specifically about how we use that in in terms of uh, I guess improving the way in which we develop skill in our athletes moving forward and how unbelievably when we see some of the things that athletes can do around the world we still know very little about how athletes get better from a skill perspective and just how much more room for improvement there is uh, and so hopefully I'm thought-provoking uh, there's a lot of questions I'll ask I don't know the answers to and, and that could be frustrating but hopefully you take something away from it so one of the, the fundamental things I talk about, whether I'm consulting to an organisation or working with my PhD students or doing just about anything, is I often start with these, these three uh, points. And this is a, a fluid conversation. It's, it's dynamic and it's never been more rapid than it has been in the history of the world, <laughs> in the history of human civilization, which is basically technology is giving us better and new measurement than ever before and it's allowing us to access that data faster than ever before. Now, as that pertains to sport, it, it means that this fundamentally is changing the way that we not only work with athletes, but also consume sports, so in fans and, and the media and the broadcast. So when I'm talking about better measurement, when I'm talking about that with respect to sport, I'm talking about us being able to understand things that happen in the sporting environment with greater detail. So here's, a, here's an example I use quite a lot. This is Tom Riley from the 70s at Everton Football Club, Goodison Park, with a stopwatch, pen and paper, measuring the runs of different footballers uh, by hand. Now, of course, we have GPS trackers and all sorts of things like that to do that almost automatically now, or at least semi in a semi automated fashion. Now, the other thing that technology is doing is allowing us to measure things in a new way, which is basically what I mean by that is measure things in the field that once upon a time we weren't able to do at all. Now, uh, straight back is actually a good example of this in, in some respects, but things like the three dimensional movement kinematics of an athlete, which until recently you had to have a very expensive laboratory set up like you can just make out down the bottom there which is full of three dimensional motion um, capture cameras, which the whole setup costs about $400,000 to do. We can now get some information, not quite as good at this as it, this yet, but we can now get this kind of information from, from vision, from optical tracking. Um, and in fact, some of the work is now doing that with, um, with broadcast vision, not even fixed cameras. So we're coming a long way with this. And then of course, the faster processing component is really just com computation. 
uh, we're able to access that quicker, uh, that data quick, more quickly because it's being processed faster. Now you'll notice that I haven't included a fourth consideration there, which is the analysis of this data, uh, which is something I spend a lot of time working in, which is uh, the improvement of algorithms, but that, that has helped, but, but certainly not as much as these first three. These are, these are fundamental. Um, now, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to spend a, a heap of time talking about the massive applications of all, all of this for tactics, player evaluation, talent ID today, but I think we've all experienced just how much this is, this is changing the landscape. So if I come back to this, this first question I asked you about what makes a good coach, uh, I've asked this question probably 15 or 20 presentations I've given around, around the world in various contexts. And, you know, these pictures here represent a coach, a, a physiotherapist, a, uh, an administrator or an athlete. And, and some of the, the most popular responses I've got have been the best coaches communicate well uh, and they have very good domain specific knowledge. I'm actually in full screen mode here, so I'm not sure if anyone's commented on, on their own thoughts about what makes a good coach, but. Apurva has done, Sam, uh, I can help you there. He says, <clears throat> one who can facilitate learning. Yep. Any others at this point that, that people want to raise? We can discuss more at the end. Okay. Uh, I think Greg so I'm going somewhere with this question. Sorry, the sorry, sorry, Sam. I was just going to say along similar lines. It's you know someone who can create learning environments, yeah. um, create learning opportunities. And I think you would argue that that both of those two characteristics there are needed to be able to do that. So uh, I think that's definitely uh, that definitely aligns. Uh, where I'm specifically going with this, with respect to the role of technology, is that. I don't think I've ever had a response from anyone saying that a coach needs to be a good technologist. Um, however, things are changing and we need to, this is as much a, a technical consideration for coaches as it is an organizational one um, and an operations research type question as well. So some of the questions I'm starting to answer and try and address with coaches from all sorts of professional sports around the world are, are these. How much technological and data literacy do I need as a coach moving forward? Unfortunately, I'm seeing some very good coaches and you probably have as well, get frozen out of sport because they don't have very much technological literacy. And what I mean by that is they don't understand the inner workings of technology. Now, that's a debate for another day about how much of that we need, but the reality, this is a question that we're all uh, facing or the, all the coaches are facing. Um, there's some very, problematic reasons behind this. Uh, the example I've used on the screen here is, you know, once upon a time, most technology we had was very obvious to us how it worked. So we call that its surface representation. So we look at a hammer and we know how a hammer works. Uh, now, most technology now has internal representations predominantly. So we can look at a computer, we can go our whole lives looking at a computer and never really understand how it works. And the same with sensors and GPS tracking units. And so, this is a, a bit of a problem, but I'll come back to it a little bit later on. Now, the second form of literacy that coaches uh, are, are constantly being um, exposed to now or needing potentially needing more upskilling in is how they understand the data that comes from that technology. So do they understand error? Do they understand that the quality of outputs from various technologies can be quite variable? Can we recognize this? Uh, I've given myself a little reminder here, but at, um, <clears throat> back in the final series of, of 2016 for um, Australian Football League here, I was working with the, the team going to a grand final. I was involved in a coaches meeting that day about we were selecting one of the last positions for the grand final. And there was a discussion from one of the coaches saying that a, a player should be selected because he could run two kilometers per hour faster than the player he was pitted up against. Now, I, at that stage, chimed in and said, well, there's about two or three kilometres error, two or three kilometres per hour error in that measurement. Now, you're talking about fundamentally a decision that could be not, not solely, but partially based on a player not competing in a game, the biggest game of his life because of a measure that's flawed. Now, so we can see that the data literacy for coaching is important. If we're going to use information, we need to have some level of literacy. 
these are other questions that I'm, I'm constantly uh, having sent to me or, or finding when I'm going into organisations. How can technology help to alleviate parts of the role of the coach? Now, this is very dangerous, but it's also very necessary. If we're going to use more technology, we need to hand over certain functions to that technology. What can we automate in our operations? What can we semi-automate? Uh, I think, again, in lots of the football codes, we've seen that with analysis of matches. That's something that coaches traditionally spent six to 10 hours a week, if not more, analysing video. And a lot of that's now being automated or semi-automated. But then on the flip side, how can we use technology to augment things that we are already very good at or to improve them? And I think good communicators are, are, are probably, I've met a lot of good communicators who are coaches that are using technology well to improve something that they're already well, well established and well skilled at. And a final point on this, of course, we could decide to opt out of technology. But if we don't engage with technology, then we run the risk of, it, of us basically conforming to wherever that technology goes. And that's a real danger as well. And I mean, I'm reminded of a bit of a quote there, uh, which is, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. And I think that's really apt here with respect to technology, because uh, I'm not sure about other people around the call, but I don't see it going anywhere uh, anytime soon. We might be able to curb it for a while, but I think it's, it's the ship has sailed. Now, there's a lot of text on this page and uh, I talk about golden rules and I'm breaking my own golden rule here. I very rarely even have any text on my slides when I give presentations, but um, audio visual is probably not as, uh, as user friendly on Zoom calls. And I, I also uh, wanted to have this as a, as a bit of a record for people to reflect on. Um, I'm not gonna walk through all of these points, but I think that first point I've, I've made at the top there is, is really just the same as what I said on the, on the previous slide. So, Well done by a lot of coaches and a lot of codes, which is the balance between using technology for experiential versus reflective cognitive modes. And what I mean by that is we tend to get gravitate towards technology that allows us to experience. So it, it allows us to become engaged in something, build curiosity and enthusiasm. So video feedback is one of the best forms of experiential learning, but it doesn't facilitate reflection very well. And we know that we need reflection in order for learning to take place. Uh, and this is not a sports specific um, consideration. This is, this is a, true of all humans. Now, video game designers are actually some of the best people for this. And uh, there's a lot of work now being undertaken in the learning communities around uh, people with video games, funnily enough. But the reality is uh, in sport, this is not done particularly well at all. And maybe this is something we could talk about a, a little bit later on in the questions. Now, I'm similarly, just, on, the, on the other... Sorry, Gaga. Can I just ask a question? So why do you think video doesn't help you in reflective learning? I mean, why, if you could elaborate that? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, I, I could answer that now, but I'd, I'd, I think we should unpack that together. I, I would also put that question back on other people from their own experience. I'm not a coach, um, so I have scientific reasons for that, but I'm interested in the coaching reasons as well. But make, just make sure you remind me because I'll come back to that. Um, and I think the other thing that's related to that, the last point I make on the right-hand side there is if technology really takes root in an organisation or a culture or indeed a sport, it can actually change tasks that we do as coaches forever. So an example I use there is um, I'm very, very poor at, at handwriting now, but I'm a very good typer. Now, you could argue, do I ever need to be a good handwriter ever again? And probably not. The task of communication via written means has changed in my lifetime uh, and in all of our lifetimes. Which tasks as a coach or us in a sport have changed forever due to technology? That's a question that we should be uh, considering because that has implications for where we're going in the future as well. Okay. I'll move from technology into learning because I, uh, but I want to keep that lens of technology going as we, as we work through here and ask another fundamental question about why we practice. And I ask this question whenever I go into any organization um, as a skill acquisition consultant, which I don't do a lot of anymore, but it, that's always something I ask straight away. Now, people know what I want to hear <laughs> and they always ask, answer this in a, in a very specific way. So I end up having to ask, well, why do we really practice uh, if we're really honest with ourselves? And of course, most people say they want to get better. Uh, but these are my observations, 
my frank observations from various sports around the world. Um, it's to fill a schedule. So the football codes, uh, professionalization of sport particularly has meant that there's only so much physical training an athlete can do in a, in a certain period of time. They schedule practice to fill the schedule. It's more than that, but I'm, I'm being, um, I'm being uh, a little bit blunt and a little bit frank. In other cases, they do it to suit an organization. So if you look at a, a large US franchise, let's say some of the major league baseball teams, for example, they do it to accommodate the fact, let's say spring training, where we've got two to 300 athletes in one place at one time. Practice is scheduled to suit the facilities that are available, the, vet, the coaches that are available in the venue. Uh, that is, so it's a logistics question, first and foremost. And then some of my fellow colleagues, sports scientists in particular, have uh, homogenized practice so much because of the, the perceived threat of injury risk that uh, essentially almost no different or particularly exertive practice takes, takes place at all. Uh, and again, the athletes end up doing something that's quite similar over and over again. Uh, of course, you can probably see this coming given the title of the, of the conversation today, but a lot of this time ideally should be spent on improving skill. Now, this seems like the most obvious thing in the world to say, but again, if you go into different sports, you will see that very few, very, very little time in some sports is spent on actually improving skill. Um, I think cricket is, is definitely not one of the, the worst offenders there. Um, I've also spent a lot of time in golf and golf does spend a lot of time on skill. But again, sounds like I'm picking on the football coach today, but they don't spend a lot of time actually working on skill. Physical training, tactical training, uh, yes. Skill per se, not so much. So moving into the second part, um, I'm gonna provide again, I won't go through all of these and you can read them off, off the screen or, or read them later, but there's a lot of good reasons why we should emphasize skill more. And in particular in the design of practice. Obviously it's very easy to change and it doesn't really cost very much money at all. It's not something that's going to cost a lot to get better at. It's very, very impactful. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. We don't really know much about the upper limits of, of skill performance in, in humans yet. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, I've talked about technology, I'll skip through them. Um, but number five, I'll stop at. Uh, we can now start to measure how our practice is going a lot better than we used to be able to do. We can monitor players over time about how they're improving, not only in competition and in practice, and we can also evaluate athlete enjoyment of those sessions, which we've probably always, always been able to do with a, with a conversation. But if you come back to my first slide when I talked about technology being able to measure things better now, this is, this is really what I'm talking about with, with that fifth point there. Uh, number seven, I'll come back to a, a, little bit, a little bit later on, but I'll keep moving through these just so we get to some of the, the media questions. So I asked the question about what it means to be a coach earlier on. I think as we move into this next section about practice design, I think most of us would agree that most coaches have a role of administering training. But is it the job of the coach to plan and evaluate that training as well? And I know a lot of sports now have all sorts of roles and positions to help with that process. Performance analysis, for example, in evaluating training. Um, most sports now, professional sports now, have a, a medical or a physical training person involved in the planning of, of training as well, at least somewhere along the line. So what is the role of coach and what's the role of technology in this process? So talking about skill, let's return to that. When I'm talking about skill, I think I often assume people know what I mean, but this is what I mean as a definition now. It's a very old definition. Um, it's, it's very debatable, There's a, and we certainly don't have time to go into the theory behind that, but this is one I, I've always liked. Um, I, I like the, the phrase there about bringing out predetermined results with maximum certainty. Um, and that's the, the analyst in me coming out a little bit there, but I think I, I like that definition of skill. Uh, I think that's, that describes some of the most skillful athletes I've seen in the world quite well. Um, we know that skill is very hard to measure because in performance where it's most valid to be assessed, there's a difference between skill and performance because there's this component of randomness and luck. Um, the more closed a sport where you're not competing against anyone else and the, and the, um, the environment is very closed, like darts, for example, performance is very, very closely aligned with, with skill. 
um, in very dynamic open sports where you've got multiple opponents getting in your way, trying to stop you from doing things in particular, it's a lot harder to measure how skillful an, actual, an athlete actually is. Uh, the other important thing as we go through the next lot of slides here is that even though there's a lot of different theoretical viewpoints on skill, every single theory um, has these, these commonalities to them, which is basically you need to practice, you need to do a lot of practice and you need some form of feedback to get better whether that's intrinsic or extrinsic. Without that, you probably won't improve. And that's, that's, a, that's something that's, that's fundamental across all those theories. Now, something that we're starting to understand more about skill is, uh, you've probably all heard that the term of skill acquisition, which um, is a, a term that's used with elite athletes as well. But to me, I always growing up understood skill acquisition as something you were you're doing at the start of learning a movement. And I think that's the way I like to talk about skill acquisition. And, and then as you grow through your, your childhood and, and learning a skill for the first time, you, you start to develop that. And then these last two phrases I've got, these last two terms here are, are much more recent here, uh, which talk about skill adaptability or being able to adapt to different situations as a continuum. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then a term which is much more, much newer altogether, which is, um, the ability for an athlete to self-regulate their skill. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by that in a moment. So this is a very old framework that was used in physical training and a colleague, of, uh, colleague and I adapted this for various questions that we wanted the skill acquisition research community to try and focus on over the next couple of decades. Um, Damien Farrow, for those of you, some of you will know Damien, he's, uh, he was the first professor of skill acquisition in Australia at the Australian Institute of Sport in the, in the 90s. Um, he works, he's worked a lot with cricket, uh, he's worked with tennis, Australian football, um, all sorts of different sports and he's, uh, he's certainly much, uh, much more an authority on skill learning than I am. But as I go through these last lot of questions that fit under this framework, and these are fairly well established principles of learning, um, what I'd like you to think about is your own environment around, around how you would, you would take up some of these challenges in the applied sense, but also the role of technology, coming back to what I talked about at the start, the, the impact that technology can have on answering some of these, these questions. Okay, this is one of the theories, and I don't want to get into the theory too much, but I, I think it's important that we talk about this, and this is where technology has really helped to understand skill. This is a, a very per, uh, pervasive view of, of skill learning um, in 2020, which is moving away from the traditional um, information processing model of, of learning to an, uh, an ecological model. And basically what this, this talks about is that things that are in someone's environment, um, we inherited themselves in an individual, in a, in a, yeah, I'll start that again, in an individual, that was tricky. <laughs> and, and also the tasks that we're asking them to do, these things interact with one another to make uh, a task either more difficult or, or, or easier. Um, it, it kind of makes sense. I think most people understand how this could work. Um, it requires some fancy modeling, of course, to, to, to uncover these relationships well, but it's a fairly simple model to understand. So basically it suggests that the most skilled individuals will find multiple solutions to conditions that they faced in competition. Um, and then these constraints that we call, these constraints relating to the environment, the task and the individual, they both limit and afford opportunities for action. So what I mean by that in practical sense, if you move the field for position in a, uh, if, if the captain of an opposing team moves a player in the field, it constrains the ability of that player to hit the shot to that area. And so they need to adapt to that by changing the way they respond to the next delivery. It's as simple as that. Uh, but it can also be some things that are more permanent. So for example, a player with a, uh, a physical impairment, they may have a shorter limb length than ideal, or they might be a short player in, in, in general, they have to change their technique or have to manipulate their technique to perform a certain type of delivery or play a certain type of shot. So constraints can be dynamic or they can be fixed and structured. So moving on to some practical questions that fit underneath this framework. And these are questions that I uh, have posed to organisations, but I've also had posed to me by coaches. And I've, I've manipulated the wording somewhere to just to fit the narrative a bit today. But So this, this first one on the left-hand side is one I get a lot, which is, 
particularly after I've done a little bit of education with coaches around um, how to make training more specific or practice more specific. They often ask, how specific do I need to make my training for that to work on my players? And how often should I use it? Now, normally where coaches are going with this is, well, we like doing match practice. We like doing match related drills, but we can't do them all the time or players don't want to do them all the time. Uh, and the other question that, that they, athletes or sorry, coaches also ask is, can we make practice actually harder than competition? What will happen to the athlete if we do that? And so some of the, the things practically that I ask coaches to manipulate as a result of this, and, and, and these are follow-up questions I might also ask uh, are on the screen here. Think about your practice environment as a set of constraints. What are the things that technology is allowing you to measure in your practice really easily in a semi-automated or indeed an automated fashion? Uh, so for example, here's some on the screen right, right now. Um, these are things I've used a lot in baseball, in fact. Um, you know, if you've ever seen baseball hitting practice in the major leagues, it's um, very, very low level of specific specificity to what we see in competition. They hit a lot more um, balls than they would in, in competition, obviously. It's a lot easier. They're typically using a, a machine, uh, which I'll come back to in a middle, in, in a moment. Um, you know, I think cricket does a lot better than baseball does, but that's just an example of a, of a, polar, a polar opposite to what we'd see in specific, specific practice. Uh, the last point I made there is on bowling machines, and I, I think we'll move past that today, but I, we might have time to chat about that in the, in the comments. But uh, again, without going too much into the theory, um, bowling machines and pitching machines uh, violate a skill acquisition principle called perception action coupling, which basically states that if the way that a, an athlete will respond to, or they'll act on a certain movement is based on their perception of that. Now, I'm sure that you've all experienced a bowling machine and a, a pitching machine before for baseballers in the audience. It doesn't look like the release of a bowler's hand. And so the evidence is very, very strong now that a skill learning effect will not, uh, not come about or not originate from work with bowling or pitching machines. Uh, the evidence is very, very strong, uh, but we see them a lot. And uh, maybe that's something we can unpack uh, a little bit in the discussion. On progression, these are some questions I get. I'll let you read them off the screen and, and I'll have a drink of water while you do that. So that, that first question has been really well answered by people in physical training. And it's a very hot topic right now with respect to injury, not so much with skill practice. And when I talk about intensity, I'm talking about how difficult should I make practice versus how much repetition should I give them? So what will happen if I go and give my player a heap of different drills that run for three hours instead of two, or if I make them only work for half an hour, but the practice is very, very difficult. Um, and then that middle question there is a question that we almost know nothing about in any sport, at least empirically, with empirical data in any sport in the world, particularly at the elite level. Uh, there's been some work done in the Netherlands on this, but there's almost no work done in the elite levels, which is basically, do athletes improve their skill once they turn professional and go to the elite level? We don't know. We know their performance, we can monitor their batting average, we can monitor their, bowl, monitor their bowling average, we don't know much about their skill whatsoever. So again, I'll, I'll continue to pick on the football codes. Once most footballers turn professional, they start to train with respect to tactics, with physical training, with respect to the, the formation of a team, and they do very, very little work on evaluating their, or improving their own isolated skill. So that's, that's something that's uh, certainly an area for, for further investigation. Why so is that, Sam, then? I mean, I'm sorry, again, I'm asking, but why is that there is no proof that skill has improved among professional athletes? Is that there is no baseline or, or there is no... Well, it's, it's a couple of things. There's a couple of things there. There's, it's hard to measure, which we talked about at the start. It's hard to separate from performance. But secondly, we're talking about minimal gains at this stage. So you're talking about athletes that are already very, very close to the perceived pinnacle of what skill behavior is. So in order to detect a change, there would be very, very small, which makes it even harder to measure. So that's another consideration. Um, 
And I think in, in certain sports, it's also felt that um, particularly the, the, the broader the team sport, that the collective, and I would agree with this, the collective um, cohesion and teamwork of the group is more important than the individual skill. And I would agree with that most of the time that I think that that takes precedence, which is the old adage, you know, um, a champion team will beat a team of champions. So that becomes a priority of, of, the, of the coach or the, or the team. So this is a, an approach that's been, um, been popularised. Again, there's not very much empirical or scientific evidence at all behind this, but it's, it's one I, I quite like and I, I'd like to see more work done on, on this, which is the notion that as a task as a task that we set our athletes becomes more difficult, their learning will, uh, sorry, their performance will drop off. And I think we've all seen this uh, with most athletes, particularly um, less, less skilled athletes. Uh, if you make something harder, people will struggle to perform as well. But we know we need to have some level of frustration or difficulty in a task in order for our athlete to improve. So the, the idea of challenge point is finding that middle ground where something is the term I use a lot is, is pleasantly frustrating for an athlete. It's, it's hard enough for them to, uh, to get a learning effect, but not so uh, difficult that they don't enjoy the task at all. Um, now, technology is helping us to identify challenge points more than we would have in the past. Because really in the, old, in the olden days, all we would have been able to do is either observe the athlete, and if they're not laying bat on ball, the task probably too hard for them. Uh, or ask them and just get their feedback. So technology is allowing us to, to get that feedback a little bit more systematic way than it, than it did perhaps um, you know, even, even five, ten, or five or 10 years ago. Uh, this might be a little bit hard to, to make out, but I just thought I'd show this from a, a, um, uh, a, I think it might be Australian football here, uh, a, a bit of a database I put together years ago for a, a team, which is basically looking at something that we would use to optimize a challenge point. So the idea here is we're looking at trying to manipulate how many players we would have in a particular drill, how many balls would be running in that drill. Um, and then there's this, I can't quite make it out on the, the left, on the right hand side there, but it's the disposals per minute or the kicks per minute. Now, the idea here is that we could go to the senior coach and say, with a challenge point, would you like to identify a drill that causes the athletes to kick or handball. Uh, sorry for the international audience here today, but kick or handball in Australian football or perform at a lower efficiency or a lower effectiveness than they would in competition. If you want to do that, these are the constraints or these are things that we can manipulate in that drill to, to cause that response. So the idea of, of, of challenge point here originated from us being able to manipulate things in a drill. Uh, and I think coaches do this intuitively anyway. And all I'm talking about here is us uh, starting to develop some scientific evidence behind that and develop a base. And it doesn't even need to be a scientific evidence. It just needs to be a record um, that can be kept within an organisation over time. Uh, I'll just go into the last couple here. I'm conscious of time. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go into um, some questions. Uh, overload. I'll let you read these as well. So what I'm talking about by overload is... Uh, that we are taking an athlete beyond their comfort zone. So skill load is different to physical load. I think that's well established. Um, you know, running a, a three kilometer time trial uh, exert uh, causes a different physical load to um, a cognitive load, for example, even though there are relationships between the two. Uh, I've talked about tactical periodization there. What I mean by that, that's a soccer term uh, or a football term, which basically talks about a model whereby the coach focuses on one element of the game for a sustained period of time and nothing else. So for example, a coach might just want to work on set pieces in football for a whole week of training and doesn't focus on anything else. So we don't know the answers to a lot of these questions, um, but I mentioned cognitive load and this is again, um, throwing the technology. This is work we've done with Tennis Australia here. And this is um, the only visual I could find of this was, was done for broadcast. But the idea here is that we are using facial recognition uh, tracking to gain feedback on the athlete's response to training without them even knowing about it. Uh, 
I talk about covert monitoring sometimes in, in different presentations I give, and this is an example of that. And um, the covert monitoring is uh, a term that kind of evokes big brother type um, <laughs> um, imagery, I think. But what I mean by that is that you're monitoring the athlete without encumbering them. Mm -hmm. um, so you're getting a valid response from them because they forget the technologies there. You're not asking them to do anything, but you're gaining some really useful information about how they're going. Now, this is an area of science that's quite early and it's, it's quite early in its infancy and its validity is not, not really well established yet. But this is an example of how technology could start to monitor practice without actually asking the athlete at all. I'll skip through these and I'll go into the last couple. Reversibility. Uh, the first sport I ever worked in was golf and uh, golf's a unique sport because uh, unlike, well, it's not a unique sport, but it's a, a different sport to many use because players often travel without their coach for a sustained period of time. Um, and this first question was one of the first questions I ever asked in my scientific career was, if you don't see your coach for three months and you, you're not working on your short game, how long is it before your short game is going to start to suffer? Or is playing enough at that point? Um, and is that a, a, an ability related question? Does that, does it not matter for the elite guys or does it, or does it matter more for the elite guys at that stage? Uh, I didn't know. And, and, you know, I did my PhD in an area related to that. and I probably still don't know the answer to this day. This is another interesting one, which uh, Gagan started on, on at the start, which how many different skills can I work on concurrently? And I think this is, um, this is leading me into um, the last, um, last couple of slides here, which is, this notion of athletes being adaptable and being able to self-regulate their learning. And I'll talk about what I mean by self-regulate in a moment. The last one in that, uh, that sport acronym is TEDIUM. Uh, I think we've all experienced uh, athletes that are getting bored with training. Um, sure, we can vary training, we can make it different, but does it actually benefit the athlete or not? Um, and I think one of the, the most important areas that is, is getting a lot of traction now in, in new school coaches is this idea of, of co-design or, or the athlete or the player being very well engaged um, in their own learning. And so when I talk about self-regulation, I'm talking about the athlete taking responsibility for their own learning uh, and being able to regulate their requirements of what they need to prepare for competition without the direct input of the coach. Now, I think we, we could all think about the best athletes we know and, and know that they're probably very capable of doing that, particularly as they, they become more experienced in their career, they know what is capable, sorry, what they, what they need to do in order to prepare themselves for competition. But in some sports, this is very difficult from an ego perspective for the coach to accept because, uh, in many cases, it's, it's harder to take the hands off. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot easier for them to keep talking, to keep engaging, to keep directing the athletes. So this is something that's um, it's certainly gaining a lot of popularity now, though. And so if we return just in, in, in kind of wrapping everything up to this continuum at the start of talking about self-regulation, uh, I won't go through these, but these are things that we adapted uh, through a, a working group with some video game designers. So coming back to the example at the start, these are 13 principles, and I'll, I'll send these slides through Gagan so people can have these. Um, 13 principles that video game designers embed into their games to ensure that players are experiencing enough that they want to keep playing the game, in some cases for days on end, but they're reflecting enough as well so that they're learning. And and again, as I said, I won't go through them all here, but the key aspect of it here is, is this notion of, of co-design, that the athlete is invested in their own, their own learning. I might be able to flick through them and you can read them yourselves. There's, there's one page there. I've tried to give some examples on, on the right-hand side. Apologies, they're not all crickets. Well, in fact, none of them are, are cricket specific. These are just things that relate to, to any sport. And so 
in kind of wrapping this up, this is an example of, uh, of just how much, and hopefully I've given you some insight today about how much we, if we still have to learn about developing skill. Um, I feel like as things are right now, and this is not true in, in most components of sports science or, or most disciplines at all, unlocking the intuition or the experiential knowledge of the coach is something that, that sports still needs to do more of. Um, the science is very much behind where the coaching is at, whereas I think in other areas like physical training, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of good empirical knowledge now about how to best develop athletes. Um, that matches the experience of, of, of fitness coaches, for example. Um, you can see here that there's so many questions that we, we still don't know a lot about, certainly empirically, but I'm sure a lot of coaches will have, uh, have their own uh, anecdotes and own uh, experiences that they want to share now. So on that, I think we'll open it up for, um, for a bit of discussion. Awesome. I mean, Hi, Sam. Good, Troy. Hello. Sorry I missed the first part of your uh, presentation. Um, as probably uh, Gagan said, I'm in my last day of isolation um, or hard isolation coming out of England. So uh, I do apologise. We were uh, just crossing our I's and dotting our T's from the coaching perspective as we finish here and about to go home. So I do apologise. But uh, I got... I got all the back end, so thank you very much. And I, I look forward to uh, expanding on some of those questions that the coaches bring up um, now. But um, I suppose for me, um, being a, uh, a first up, having a, a lot of a lot to do with Mr. Damien Farrow in, when he first started yeah. the AIS. So uh, a very good man with a lot of knowledge. So uh, uh, I can probably share a glass of red over you with some of the stories I know about him and his early starts. Uh, but we can we can take that offline. At, some other stage but um yeah i mean i love the i love the, the thought that you're building an autonomous learning uh, um, person you know obviously self-determination theory if we can take that into the athlete i think we've got a great opportunity um as coaches to to really start to um start to have a, a process and an environment where we can you know just keep that learning environment so open and so directed back into their um hands that you know, it's going to have a great impact. So, um, I, I, look, I'm going to be quiet there. I love what you said. I um, look forward to hearing some of the comments um, coming from the coaches. Thank you, thank you, Troy. I, guys, I, I think uh, Sam has done a very has pulled a smart one on us, on you guys rather. He has actually asked a lot of questions. Right, while he is obviously looking for empirical and scientific objectivity, objective reality, I think we all have a subjective reality and personal reality. So I think uh, thoughts, comments will be very, very appreciated. Yeah. So I think these are very interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go back to one of your um, questions or comments there, Sam, about you know, do players once they become professional, do they get better? Um, yeah. I mean, it's not empirical evidence, obviously, but I can say from my own point of view, yes, I was forced to get better by the opposition. Now, whether that's totally the physical skills or combined with decision-making, mental skills and, and all of that, but I think every, all of the better players that I played with and against and have been involved with from a coaching point of view, they've all got better at their skills because they've been forced by the opposition to develop and adapt to the way that they're being attacked and, and so on. So, um, you know, I, I, I understand the Aussie football stuff better than uh, the guys in India, obviously. I mean, I, I do watch a lot of AFL football. I wonder whether some of them are getting better. Um, but, you know, I think that's a very different sport, you know, going back to your point about, you know, a, a good team beating, a, you know, team of good players uh, and they do concentrate a lot on the, the team defence and all of those things that um, maybe takes away from the time that could be invested in getting players better and I particularly refer to goal kicking, uh, particularly set shots. You look at blokes who do nothing but kick footballs all day and you know from 25 metres out straight in front they can't um, 
complete the task. You, it seems um, hard to hard to fathom, but I think from a you know cricket, whilst it's a team game, there's a lot of individual activity, and therefore you're doing a lot of individual development within the team environment because of the the nature of the game. And I, I think all of the best players that I've seen. Um, you know, watching before I, I played, um, playing at that level and then coaching at that level, all of the better players do get better. No doubt about it. I might just respond quickly to that and, and, and maybe with another question. And I should have made this distinction. You actually made the point then, Greg, in that you were forced to get better. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and you may, it may be a little bit of both, but so the environment of the competition is what caused or what forced the improvement rather than the training environment. I think that was a, one of the points I was, I was going to make. So I, maybe a question for you would be, did you alter or was your training or practice environment altered because you knew that competition required you to you train in a more specific way to competition? So for example, if you had have continued to train the way you did before being exposed to those elite environments, would that have been sufficient or did you need to change practice as well? Yeah, good question. And, and yes, you did need to change. Um, you know, bear in mind that, you know, I played in, in an era before coaches. So a lot of it was self-driven and a lot of it was internal. You couldn't necessarily change the types of pitches. You couldn't necessarily replicate exactly the, the types of bowlers that, um, you know, you were facing. But it meant going back to another one of your points as well about the importance of reflection. It meant reflecting on what the challenges were and then, if nothing else, creating in your own mind the environments that uh, helped you to, um, to, to get better. You know, then having gone on and, and coached, there's no doubt that there are times when you need to change the, uh, the training environment, whether that's the, the structure of the training session or whether you're actually physically uh, changing the, the surface that you, you're training on to get outcomes that you're, you're looking for. There's no doubt doing the same thing day in, day out is not going to make you better. And I do see that. I think that's one of the things you talked about golf. I think cricket and golf are two sports that, you know, train in one environment and play in another. So if that training environment is not managed properly, uh, the, the likelihood is that the player will get worse rather than better. Training for hours at a low intensity um, is not a way to improve skills. Um, you know, a question for you. I mean, one thing that I've found uh, as experience as a coach is that actually training at low speed, so doing drills at, at a much lower speed than would be, you know, that compared to the bowlers, you know, you talked about baseball and batting, batting practice and so on. Um, one thing at the, you know, at the professional level in, in baseball, they tend to use real pitches, but they tend to be older pitches who are not throwing at the, the high speeds that the elite pitches will be doing. But in cricket, I've, I've seen and I've you know, instituted uh, training drills that are done at much slower speeds, and I've seen a much greater... Uh, transition, uh, you know, adaptation from that into a game than actually bowling machines or the the dog sticks um, being used to try and replicate the more more the pace that they're used to doesn't work as much as I've found with the slower throwdowns and things that actually make players have to change their body position. To, to get an optimal strike on, on the ball. Whereas with a bowling machine or a dog stick, you can, uh, you can just stand there and throw the hands at it and not actually get better at uh, moving from one position to another position. So uh, I don't know whether you've seen any of that sort of thing in, um, in your travels. Yeah, pl plenty of it. And uh, there's, there's no question. I mean, I've touched very quickly on, on action perception uh, coupling, but uh, and that's a good example of it then. So a, a lower, uh, and again, you would know with, with baseball that the, the slower pitches are also thrown, but they're thrown from closer. 
so they will throw a slower velocity you know, pitch from a closer area, um, which is designed in some way to mimic the deceleration of the ball before impact. But again, it's at a lower intensity. So there's no, no, there's no question at all in my mind and in, certainly in the science that I've, I've read is that, that that has more value from a learning perspective than something that is um, not, not representing action and perception coupling, which is with a machine or with a, as you said, the dog stick. Um, there's, there's very little benefit comparatively. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the bowling machine has been good for coaches, but it hasn't been good for players. Uh, David, do you have a question? So, do you, you, you want to go ahead with it? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anna. That's um, really interesting. Uh, just a quick question around the move towards ecological dynamics as an approach um, and the constraints involved in that. Where, in your view, does direct instruction fit? Does it, doesn't it, are we can, like, better off constraining the environment and the, and the task as opposed to, I guess, what we've been previously directing instruction? It's, that's a very, very good question, and it's it's a, a very heated discussion point between skill acquisition scientists at the moment, as you I think you're probably aware of, as you're pitching that question. Um, firstly, what I would say in answering that, and I'm not trying to sit on the fence, is I'm not actually a, a, I don't sit in either camp in terms of these this theoretical approach. I'm a big advocate of the constraints that approach, and the main reason I am is because I think it provides a very useful framework for coaches to design their training around and evaluate it. Uh, so in answer to your question, I don't think I have an answer. Uh, I, th I think um, it, it, my, my um, and this is again without any scientific um, uh, investigation behind it, my uh, inkling would be as the player moves along the continuum from being a beginner to elite, direct instruction um, is less required at the, at the elite level and that can be done through subtle manipulations in the in the in the environment that's that's i guess my my quick answer yeah thanks, thanks, thanks. That's my view was that we've got away from it that's at a younger level for the developing player um and said like the game's going to be the teacher as opposed to perhaps at times direct instruction may be in value um so we kind of maybe moved away from it david we, uh, at least i'm finding a very difficult uh your voice is is it uh or is it my laptop I'm finding it difficult. David, no, I felt it hard to hear as well. Sorry, I'm just saying about, is that any better? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm just saying, I think that we've perhaps moved away from the uh, direct instruction when working with developing players, younger players, in favour of the task being a teacher. Um, I just wondered if that's something we perhaps have to think about as coaches, um, not moving away from using direct instruction when appropriate. Yeah, I think there's a, I think scientifically there's a way that this could be could be evaluated. But again, it's something that would need to, to be done in the future, which would be um, something around the notion of functional variability. So the idea that um, when does a movement become stable? That's what, sorry, that's what I'm probably talking about. When's a movement stable and an appropriately stable that the athlete is using variability in that technique in a functional way? So what I mean by that is if if an athlete, if it's, sorry, let's just say it's a child. If a child can't perform the movement very well and you're going to manipulate the training environment to try and invoke some kind of skill learning, but their technique is, is not even close to being where it needs to be, whatever that means, where it needs to be, then that's not going to be effective for them, uh, I, I don't think. But the, the notion, what, what the unknown is, is what is acceptable technique and what is very what is acceptable variability within that technique um, what's the noise versus what's the the functional variability and that's something we i don't think we have a we don't we haven't solved that yet i don't think uh, i think uh, uh troy paris would love to hear from bowling, bowling perspective uh, what do you make of you know some of the points which and some of the questions he has posed? It'll be interesting to see how because bowlers lead the game right in cricket, uh, and everybody follows. So, what's your perspective on some of the questions which Sam has posed, right? Uh, right from skill development to you know, environment and so on and so forth. Any points? 
think you need to have good knowledge um, to understand, you know, those variables that you talk about, you know, when is skill stable and when can you progress it to the next level and uh, moving, you know, obviously through the, um, those variables of movement, variability, complex training, um, team-based training, and then you get to that performance stability at training, you know, and that's right down the other end of the, you know, the, the, the continuum where you've got performance training taking place and you've got skill optimization. So you, you need to have a pretty good understanding of what stability looks like at certain levels. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, something that, you know, the coach will need to get an understanding of what does a skill look like? What is uh, stability? And then what do you do to move them through to the next stage? And I like the, uh, you know, the constraints-based learning model as a, as a good theory to underpin what you do. Interesting. Yeah, a question yeah. I'll ask that because I haven't done a lot in, in cricket, uh, but it, you know, if I look at baseball pitching and let's say there's a desired, and then they use a, um, a rap soda unit or a track man unit to, to measure the spin. So, which would be similar, I suppose. Uh, but there's a perception in, um, and it's not backed up by a lot of evidence from what I've seen. There's a perception that a pitcher can go and throw 30 pitches at 85 miles an hour, but they can't throw 15 at 95 miles an hour from the physical, physical load capacity. But from a skill perspective, if you can in, uh, impart a certain um, characteristic on, on that pitch, so let's say it's spin, spin rate that you're trying to, or, or the spin axis that you're trying to impart, um, does that hold up when they increase their velocity of the pitch? That's, that's something that I think um, still needs to be looked at in baseball. I'm interested in the take on that from a, a fast bowling or a spin bowling perspective. That if it's, and, and it's related to what Greg said around, um, around intensity as well, really. Uh, does training at 85, 90%, do, do those parameters hold true when you, when, you, when you ramp up the intensity a little bit? Not just the intensity of the, the delivery, but also the environment, I suppose, as well. I think it comes back to your question whether the skill's stable or not. Yeah. And then you've got to be really clear there whether it's stable, whether you then progress to the next level. Um, so you really need to have a good idea of the stability to move to that next um, skill adaptation to that next level because obviously you're moving through that continuum again, aren't you? You know, you, you're trying to improve performance. Um, so you've got to be pretty clear on where they're at and have a good idea of what that skill is before you move to the next one and then as you said you need to have some sort of measurement system to be able to you know qualify or quantify what you're doing there um, there's no doubt the technology is definitely helping us you know um, with the biomechanical 3d analysis you know now i've been able to then manipulate that situation for the bowler to move from five k's and you know five k's more like um, are you going to increase your run-up speed or do you increase your effort at the crease to get that five k's and then being able to look at what actually you know, what objective you've got and then you know, what sort of things you're putting in place. But the technology to measure that is, uh, is getting a lot better. And you know, then you can sort of quantify what you're doing and then maybe then, okay, I'm stable there. I can bowl an, uh, an outswing and now 5Ks an hour faster. Okay, what do we do now? Do we swing it more or do we, or do we go faster again? So, you know, <laughs> how much is enough? But, you know, again, just... Again, you, you just keep following that that nice principle of uh, overload principles. You know, measuring, quantifying, moving to the next. But you've got to make sure they're stable to be able to produce that in the game. Because I suppose that's where you want to be, isn't it? You want to be able to produce that particular skill under game intensity. That's the ultimate measure. So, you know, if you you can reproduce that in training. You've got an option. You've got a great opportunity to actually improve your skills at training. But if you can't match the, the, the game expectations, it's going to be hard to get it in training. Hmm. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. yep. A, a good ball at 85% in a game is probably better than a bad ball at 100%. So. Well, exactly. So, yeah, so, you know, you've got to look at what the object, object of that, that um, skill is, you know, it's, it's well, the, well, the objective is to get the bat, batsman out, isn't it? Or it might not be, it might be just to uh, stop a run or do something like that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cool area to think about. But you do need to know what, what the skill should look like and whether it's stable or not. And I think that's pretty important. 
Cool. I think we're running, but yeah. uh, I'll just hand it last question to Dilip because uh, Dilip, do you want to go ahead and then we can wrap this up? Nice. It was very, very good uh, in detailed description. I think something I really fascinated about is about the implicit and explicit learning, which was a lot talked about different courses we attended. And something I want to know from you is, does environmental uh, growth or the culture where the brawn and brought up, because if you look at India, there are a lot of people coming from a very small states and countries where the studies are pretty less and their, in a, their capacity to grasp whatever we say is less. So does it play a major role? That is something I want to know. Yeah, again, I, I, I feel like I'm a broken record here saying we, we don't we don't really know uh, because it's very hard to measure. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me because I did mean I did mean to mention that when I talked firstly about a, a constraints led approach, and certainly proponents of that approach would suggest that the environment and the culture are just another constraint to consider there. So they would influence they would influence the learning, and I think we'd all we'd all agree that agree with that. We've all seen athletes and, and the imp yeah. the impact of environment and culture on the, on their learning, uh, but it's extremely intangible and it's. Uh, and when I talk about things being easy to measure moving forward, uh, that is that, that those are one of the areas that are going to be very hard to measure even now and into the future. Um, the psychological component, you know, the communication, the environment, culture, they're very hard to measure. And even if, when we can measure them, there's not a good agreement on how to measure them. Um, so it's a very tricky one. Is that, is that, is that, it depends. Is that what you say? It depends. I think I've said that to everything today. Ah, it's beautiful. I think there's some uh, there's some great learnings in that word because we are individual. That doesn't mean that we can't find some some good things at work um, across the board. But yeah, it's a it's a great word. And coaching. It depends. How are you gonna <laughs> How are you gonna address this? Try. It depends. You know, it depends I, I on the five skills. It depends for that reason. <laughs> yeah, there's five skills, isn't there? Those five skill fundamentals, you know, and each one of them is got to is got to play a part in whether something's can be executed to the to the the the, the standard that you're looking for. Um, so one of those five skills is going to have an impact. So you, you better know what each of those five fundamental skills are before you even start, I suppose, and be able to profile those to a certain extent to see where somebody is on the continuum. In any one of those, and wow, <laughs> now you're in trouble. You don't want to confuse anything, and you just need some good technology and some good professors to, you know, you know, be able to do all this research and give us uh, us coaches some good feedback <laughs> and direction. <laughs> so, so, well, just get rid of some of the conventional wisdom and put in place some good scientific uh, rhetoric and some good scientific facts, and exactly. maybe we'll get the art and the science back together again. Yeah. Beyond culture and environment, uh, for everything else you want to measure, uh, straight bat is there, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to add that line. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, Sam, thank you so much. Uh, this was very, very interesting. Some of the questions uh, I need to, I mean, quite frankly, grasp again, read again to understand what you actually trying to indicate. So it was very, very intense. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate this. And guys, uh, thank you so much for uh, you know, turning over. Appreciate your time. Uh, until we meet next time, I wish you a fantastic uh, week ahead uh, and a weekend for folks in India. Enjoy the national holiday tomorrow and have fun. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Kagan. Kagan. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Lovely. Thank, thank you. So